Oh, thanks. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our BPPB seminar series. So today uh, we'll have our tutorial and the research work by Mustafa Abdi from UCSF. Um, so as you know, we have our rules. Uh, you, you already know, we'll put it in our chat uh, box as well. So with that, I think we'll just let uh, Mustafa to start. Thank you, I really appreciate it. And um, thank you to the organizers for this wonderful opportunity, which I got to learn pretty late. I guess it's been there for two years and I've, no I've been noticing recently. So I'm really excited to be part of it from uh, now on. Um, uh, my lab uh, is focusing of, on uh, principles of biological time control. Um, and one of uh, our particular interests is autonomous clocks. This is an emerging um, topic in biological timing field. Um, and I will be talking about in the first half of the talk, a little tutorial on autonomous clocks. Um, so I have a few goals for this tutorial. Uh, and the first goal is I'd like to brief a little retrospective on the classic knowledge of cellular timing and its limitations. Um, we've pretty much grew up with learning on uh, topics on cell cycle and the circadian clock, and they've pretty much changed our view of how biological time might be controlled. Uh, but with recent findings in the literature, um, we're, we're starting to learn that these uh, uh, time control mechanisms are not the, uh, uh, the final explanations of how time might be controlled. Um, and then I'd like to introduce uh, this concept with its potential hallmarks of design and tuning, uh, as well as um, the type of physical mechanisms that could explain how uh, different biological clocks uh, might be uh, uh, mode locked or phase locked to uh, run at the same frequency. There are uh, several public publications on phase locking, both from theoretical and, and very few on the experimental. And so I will talk about those a little bit today. Um, and finally, I will talk about the evolution and function of autonomous clocks. Um, and especially this is important because in appreciating uh, biological oscillations and biological clocks, I think we must be uh, paying attention to function and the evolution because they have a lot to teach us. And if we have time, I will theorize on the evolution of autonomous clocks. Um, the current debate is whether there could be a selective drive uh, by say uh, photoperiodic cues uh, or some other periodic cues that are environmental or could these type of clocks uh, uh, emerge as feedback loops with that didn't diverge into becoming adaptive loops and with rather properties that fits into uh, becoming a clock. Um, so hopefully I will wrap up all of this within this half an hour, probably it won't be possible. Um, so I've been studying uh, biological timing, principles of biological timing for the past uh, four or five years. And while I was doing that, I sort of started to realize from the literature uh, that there's somehow a holy trilogy of discovering autonomous clocks. Um, and sorry, discovering biological timing from the, uh, from, the, um, uh, from the literature. And that is the holy trilogy that I mentioned is going from clock to mechanism um, to function. Well, it's not as simple as this as I'm realizing because sometimes people discover periodic functions that are not necessarily with a known clock or uh, some oscillatory mechanisms without any indication that it might be a biological clock and without perhaps any biological function. So the Holy Trilogy is actually uh, um, bi-directional. You, you may start with discovering a mechanism that might be a clock and that it might have a function. And um, in terms of the biological timing that we biological timing mechanisms that we've all loved and studied, and they, they are the CDK dependent cell division cycles and circadian clocks. Uh, there are uh, two sociological insights that I have to tell, and, and in, especially in terms of what led to the uh, advances in the studies uh, of, of these timing mechanisms. And that starts with an initial observation. In terms of the cell cycle, this initial observation is essentially the uh, cell division as you might appreciate. Um, and this cell division phenotype goes back to perhaps the advent of the light microscope. And we can take it back to 17th century 
or single celled organisms that could divide. And um, in terms of the series descriptions of the cell cycle, this goes back to the 19th century. And likewise with the circadian clocks, the initial observations go as far as the 17th century with plant uh, photoperiodicity. Um, and so we can date this back to as old as a Renaissance, uh, essentially, period. The important thing for, I guess, studying both the cell cycle and the circadian clock is that the initial observations, which are visible, so that are what I call um, intuitive phenotypes. So these phenotypes are visible to the eye and therefore intuitive. And so from there, from, from that point onwards, you could see that how these intuitive phenotypes directly uh, constitutes a function uh, without any effort. Um, and what happened in both the cell division cycle field and the circadian clock field is the next thing was basically studying the genes uh, in the 20th century that led uh, to the discoveries of the mechanisms uh, for all of these, um, uh, uh, for, for the mechanisms that are responsible for the cell division cycles. And likewise, the output here um, were the genes, sadly, uh, people who discovered the initial genes, uh, say Merbenzer and Rankonapka, couldn't join the a group of scientists who received the Nobel Prize on circadian clocks, yet the, the genes and going to mechanisms was a true tour de force uh, because uh, realizing the uh, type of mechanisms that leads to a, a circadian anticipation was a true uh, feat of genetics. And um, the important thing about both the cell division cycle and the circadian clock and, and their noticeable effect on biology is coming necessarily from their efficacious and promiscuous nature. So you may have seen in the literature that lots of events or lots of uh, uh, phenomena are coupled to either the cell cycle or the circadian clock uh, when you look at it at a, a face value. And I'm gonna write them here as being efficacious and promiscuous. Because they are very efficacious and promiscuous, they are hypothesized both for the cell cycle and the circadian clock to really act as ratchets. And what, is, what does a time ratchet mean? It is the type of thing that when its activity starts from the bottom uh, as it's going towards the top, it creates these effective thresholds of activity that triggers specific biological events. So for example, during the cell cycle, um, you go through DNA replication, you uh, duplicate your centrioles, and then you start breaking your nuclear envelope breakdown and you form a spindle, and then you segregate your chromosomes. So all of this has been imagined as a ratchet um, that the CDK cycling oscillator, as it goes through its increasing activity, uh, starts to trigger uh, these events. Now, at this point, uh, you may think this could explain many things uh, and this could pretty much sum up uh, what the biological timing uh, 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 enterprise could look like in cell biology. Well, that wasn't quite the case because uh, there, what I've called uh, many observations that were non sequiturs. So these were the type of observations that if you mention at a conference or something, they would say to you, oh, okay, so that's an exception. But there were way too many non sequiturs that the, um, the time ratchet idea and also the uh, limitation of just having a cell cycle or the circadian clock to explain biological timing has come to a point that, uh, that the increasing evidence on potential things that could autonomously be uh, controlled uh, got to a limit, especially in the past decade. And I will elucidate uh, some of those uh, in this bottom uh, part of my slide. Um, so as I called them, they are uh, non sequiturs. So these are the cyclic phenomena that appear to occur independently of the cell cycle or the circadian clock, uh, yet um, they're either mechanistically ambiguous uh, or epiphenomenal or fun functionally ambiguous. So what do I mean by that? Let's talk about mechanistically ambiguous ones. Um, so these are the type of uh, phenotypes that you see is there, yet you cannot attach a function or a mechanism to it in terms of its clock. And what I'm talking about is the type of uh, seminal observations with cortex oscillations in uh, frog eggs, for example, um, or cycles in 
uh, pH levels or carbon dioxide oscillations in yeast. And on the other hand, um, as I mentioned, another category of uh, oscillatory phenomena that appears like phenomenal uh, because they're not necessarily endogenous and you would see these things happening when you trigger stress uh, in biology. So um, for example, P38 uh, MAP kinase oscillations um, or P53 expression oscillations um, and similarly uh, NF kappa B oscillations. And the final uh, section that I wanna talk about is those that are functionally ambiguous. So what does it mean to be functionally ambiguous? This is, I think, the most curious part um, because you see there are oscillations in a molecule or its activity or its proteoform, uh, and you, you know its mechanism, how it occurs, yet you cannot attach a function to it. And these things are rare, obviously, but they're, they're there. Oscillations in potassium channel activity um, or P34, tyrosine, phosphorylation cycles. So the point I'm trying to make here is that in the Holy Trilogy I mentioned that links mechanism to a function to an output, um, e either one of these components are essentially ambiguous in all of these categories. And so when you have something ambiguous, um, you tend to brush it away because it doesn't uh, make sense in current paradigms. Um, but uh, past decade of research, as I mentioned, is starting to elucidate mechanisms, functions, and potential uh, uh, um, uh, physiological and disease roles that, that, that could be attached to basically uh, some of these oscillations that I will be talking about. Um, and as I said, the doom of these phenotypes were that they were either uh, neither visible um, nor intuitive, unlike the cell division cycle or the circadian clock. But of course, with the advent of many sophisticated techniques with high throughput approaches or sophisticated imaging, uh, we start to realize that many of these oscillatory phenomena might and could have a function uh, that's beyond the textbook um, information. So there is an emerging interest in the concept of autonomous clocks. Um, the idea of an autonomous clock is nothing new. Uh, it's been there for a long time. And uh, it's been there in terms of the theories that could uh, elucidate what, what it could look like. Um, yet the evidence was largely missing. But as I said, the past 10 years has been a boom, uh, has shown a boom of studies that could uh, um, open up a potentially a new uh, area of research on this. So what is an autonomous clock? It's, it's the type of subcellular timing mechanism that's normally entrained by the cell cycle or the circadian clock to run synchronously but they've evolved to run independently to, time, to regulate the uh, time execution of a cellular event. Um, and in terms of thinking of an autonomous clock, you have to think two foresights that this hypothesis has. One is that these clocks could be highly redundant in that if you were to imagine uh, multiple clocks that's regulating certain biological events, um, and they are phase locked to run at, the sim at similar frequencies so as to not interfere with each other. What you will see here is um, as this circuit is um, continuing to run, if you were to take out one of these clocks here, the other clocks are likely gonna continue functioning. So the system is highly redundant and it's potential that a clock might rescue the function of another clock. And I will elucidate some examples in the next slides as to uh, how could this occur. Um, and the other thing, other foresight about an autonomous clock is that they're highly specialized. This means that you don't have to assign a master clock to a biological function that has to specifically control that event, uh, control many events, um, because when you take out that clock, then all of those many events will come to an halt in terms of their timely regulation. Uh, so it almost doesn't make sense to have a master clock anyway, but uh, a foresight of an autonomous clock would be that they would be highly specialized. So in claiming uh, about this hypothesis, I'd like to give some recent examples uh, from the literature 
that perhaps will um, help you uh, uh, going forward, perhaps, you know, studying it, and especially for the trainees in the audience, it'll be extremely helpful because they could look these papers up and look up these studies if they want to pursue it in the future. Um, and I want to start with uh, uh, two studies that came from the Hase and Takahashi labs on a plasmodium differentiation cycle. Essentially, uh, they find that there's a 17 hour uh, cycle of a plasmodium differentiation cycle um, that runs uh, normally in the body in malaria, for example, the entrainment with the circadian clock. But when you take the uh, parasite or the plasmodium out of the uh, system, then it starts to run at its own frequency for its differentiation. So as you can see, there's a class uh, here that we can uh, identify that's uh, involved in a differentiation cycle. And as I said, these are work from Ase and Takahashi labs, Joe Takahashi's lab. And the next thing about cellular organization, and this is basically what, what we have been mostly focusing at, uh, on uh, both back in England and here at UCSF, and that is, um, for example, the centriole biogenesis clock. So we know that there is this clock that controls centriole biogenesis cycle. And as I will explain uh, in, in, a, uh, in a bit, uh, this clock uh, is basically running both in um, uh, cell cycle uh, uh, progressing tissues where you can have this clock entrained by the cell cycle clock. But if you're in a differentiated tissue, this clock still runs and it continues to produce centrioles. For example, for air, airway epithelial cells and differentiated cells where you don't have a strong uh, uh, cell cycle entrainment, or if any. And the next thing is today's talk that I will talk about after this tutorial, which is on autonomous uh, cytoplasmic divisions. And that's basically under the category of cellular organization. And then finally, there's a real um, group of people um, who study homeostasis. Uh, and uh, this relates to uh, autonomous metabolic oscillations. Um, and of course, the initial studies were uh, done by Bantu and McKnight, and then advanced by um, uh, later on by uh, uh, Matthias Heinemann's lab and Mark Kirchner's lab recently. And this is a really exciting uh, finding uh, that's uh, uh, finding its way among the autonomous clocks. Although the clock is not necessarily clear, it is clear that the metabolic oscillations could run independently of the cell cycle and potentially of the uh, circadian clock. And finally, uh, I'd like to raise attention to proteostasis cycles. And this is work done by Bokai Ju and his lab. Um, and that's basically uh, a 12 hour clock that could run independently of the circadian clock and is regulated by uh, the uh, cycles in phase phase separation of nuclear speckles related to um, uh, the proteostasis regulation by, I believe by XPV1 and IRE1. Uh, but please uh, read uh, papers from Bokai's lab to be able to uh, get further insights on the proteostasis cycles. So as an example, I'd like to give, um, as a detailed example, I'd like to talk about the central clock um, that I was fortunate to be part of. And that is uh, started with not randomly, but with, with the knowledge that, um, as I said, there was a clock uh, mechanism and function uh, trilogy. And in this trilogy, we knew for years, for perhaps two decades, that Centriole can duplicate uh, independently of the cell cycle. Um, and in this effort, we basically were able to identify both the clock and the mechanism of that clock that leads to the uh, Centriole duplication, cycles of Centriole duplications. And in a nutshell, basically, when a mother centriole uh, is uh, starting the cell in a cell cycle, is starting, it's covered by this receptor protein called astralis that is going to start recruiting a ligand called pololite kinase 4. And this kinase is important in the function of this clock because this, uh, this kinase is basically first autophosphorylating itself. And then the autophosphorylation starts uh, uh, it to be active, further active to start triggering centriole growth. And um, as the centriole grows, PLK4 uh, as an enzyme is also uh, phosphorylating its receptor and it is an inhibitory phosphorylation. And this inhibitory phosphorylation over time 
will lead to um, the receptors unbinding from the phosphorylated PLK4. And that likely that this kinase is also being ubiquitinated because it's um, autophosphorylation in trans triggers its own ubiquitination. And perhaps there's a siphoning phenomena here that basically gets rid of the uh, PLK4 from the system. And in the meantime, um, the phosphorylated PLK4 from the system. And in the meantime, there's likely a phosphatase, mitotic phosphatase yet to be discovered that basically resets the uh, a loop to go back to its original state. And at this point, as the um, PLK phosphorylated PLK4 unbinds from astrolus, then the central growth essentially stops. So if you look at PLK4's uh, activity or the centriolar PLK4s on, on centrioles, you could see that it goes through these oscillations that are entrained by the cell cycle. And uh, if you go above an affected threshold, as shown here, you can start growing the centrioles. And if you go below this affected threshold, you stop growing the centrioles. And if you stop the cell cycle, for example, by uh, a cocktail of double-stranded RNAs against all mitotic cyclins, then you can um, run this cycle still, but at a different frequency, which we call the natural frequency of this oscillator. That's about in one and a half times uh, 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 slower than when it was phase locked to basically the cell cycle oscillator. But again, the effective threshold remains the same and it remains to it, it continues to trigger central duplications nevertheless. Now, the important thing is that this clock is conserved from mammals, um, flies to mammals. And that was worked by Takao and colleagues in 2019. And then in differentiated cells, it worked from Momachub's group showed that the same enzyme, PLK4, controls the pace of um, uh, centriol biogenesis in order to template cilia in airway epithelial cells. Um, so it seems that this clock that we've identified in fly embryos turns out to be functional, uh, both in uh, um, uh, mammalian tissue and in otherwise uh, physiology. Now, as you see here, it has many components, right? Identifying a clock, identifying a mechanism, identifying a function. So it, this could be a daunting task, in fact. And therefore, it, it is a problem that requires eclectic approaches. Um, first of all, the field is lacking a systematic approach to identify subcellular clocks. If you were to set out a genetic screen or a proteomic screen to identify autonomous clocks, what would that screen look like? So I think um, uh, uh, the next challenge in the field is like what happened with the cell cycle or the circadian clock, yet on a much bigger scale, to be able to do this type of screen to identify more subcellular clocks. And we lack a comprehensive theoretical framework. A comprehensive theoretical framework, especially for phase locking, uh, as I mentioned here, you can have a lot of oscillators and they're um, coupled to a potentially a strong oscillator that basically entrains them, yet a theoretical framework of how biology could achieve this is essentially missing. And then in terms of uh, molecular studies into mechanisms is also lacking. And I will elucidate perhaps in the next slide um, about what type of hallmarks uh, these uh, autonomous clocks display so as to be able to invigorate others to identify uh, potential other mechanisms. And in that case, um, we also need to know studies addressing relevance for physiology and medicine, because uh, studying an oscillator for the sake of an oscillator, you could just be a physicist and do that. But I think in biology, it really matters that we focus on functions and uh, their relevance for disease. So um, there are several emerging hallmarks of autonomous clocks. Um, and one of those is, uh, I guess you can uh, divide these into subgroups. And in the first subgroup, you basically talk about the type of uh, um, protein motifs that lead to uh, making autonomous clock. Uh, you, could have a, you could generate a feedback loop via suicidal enzymatic activity. So say you have an enzyme that can uh, start phosphorylating or modifying itself. And then this modification triggers both its activity yet also its path to degradation. Um, and that would start inhibiting it uh, from where it was docked. And essentially you're creating this feed forward loop that attaches the input to the feedback uh, of the same system that's essentially required for becoming an autonomous clock. 
are there such enzymes? Yes, uh, protein kinase C uh, um, is, for example, a, um, an auto-regulatory enzyme that its activity uh, triggers its own uh, inactivity. And likewise with polokinase 4 that we've identified uh, for the case of centrial duplications. And then also uh, calcium calmodulin dependent protein kinase 2, which was recently shown to uh, use this oscillatory activity to control neuronal behavior. Um, and that's, that's a, this one is a really interesting paper that I highly recommend uh, looking at. And the next thing that an oscillator could form is basically a, a form via self-regulated proteoforms, and you could become basically a bifunctional kinase phosphatase. Um, and that, that has the ability to be able to both phosphorylate itself, but also dephosphorylate itself such that, um, uh, that, it, that it can create an integral time in which you're active. So the chi abc oscillator, in essence, uh, for the cyanobacteria circadian clock is a genuine example of this. And it turns out that uh, looking into the literature, there are many other potential bifunctional kinase phosphatases, uh, both in plants, but also in bacteria that uh, is out of my expertise, but I'm sure would be of very much interest to those of you who are studying plants or bacterial systems. So I highly recommend looking into bifunctional uh, kinase phosphatases in these systems. And then a theoretical case would be distributive phosphorylation and dephosphorylations. What do I mean by that? A substrate can only be at one time phosphorylated by kinase and cannot be dephosphorylated in a futile way. Um, and, and likewise, when a phosphatase is in action in the system that I'm talking about at population levels, while the phosphatase is working, the kinase cannot be working. So this could itself uh, land an autonomous uh, clock uh, yet, um, I don't know of a specific example that could be used here uh, as, a, um, as an incident. And I would like to also uh, talk about pace tuning um, by peptide variances or chemical properties or the phase locking uh, phenomena. But sadly, I'm coming to an end of my time. So I'd rather take a few questions before uh, I go on to talking about the, um, the, uh, uh, the research. And if not, then um, we'll jump right onto the research talk. So I will just give it a little pause and uh, yeah. take a little. Thanks, here. Mustafa. I'm just about yeah. to tell you this time. So um, I haven't seen any question from the uh, chat box. Uh, if any of you have questions, just uh, you know, uh, unmute yourself. We may take a one or two questions. So if not, let me ask you a question. So. Um, I'm always curious if you, um, actually I talked to Bob High about this as well, um, you know, um, so if for those oscillating things, if we just look at the culture cells, uh, beside the cell cycle, the things there, uh, easy for, it's easy for us to just uh, identify by doing some, you know, continuous life, life cycle imaging? Yeah, so this is a wonderful question. Um, there will be specific cells that are more amenable to discover autonomous oscillations. And for example, embryonic cells, for example, embryonic stem cells or stuff like that, because these are the type of cells that will naturally lack the circadian clock expression and its entrainment. Um, so, and, uh, you know, in terms of thinking about the checkpoints that would normally perturb the cell cycle, those are usually not present in the embryonic cells. So for example, P53 checkpoint, that's normally very uh, strong of a checkpoint in, uh, in a proliferating cells um, that are, uh, say, progenitors of differentiated cells. In the embryonic stem cells or in any embryonic tissue, P53 pathway is largely eliminated. So even if you stop the cell cycle and we know that naturally the circadian clock is off, you can essentially discover uh, likely many autonomous phenomena in these tissues. And that's sort of the philosophy that we take in the lab as to why we study embryonic cells uh, to pursue this, these phenomena. I see. Um, I noticed uh, there's a, a Chandra raised hand. So uh, well, I'll take this uh, one more question from Chandra then before we uh, switch the uh, research. Chandra, can you just ask a question? Yeah. Hi, uh, so uh, my question is regarding uh, something that is based on the I et al. 2008 paper, where they stress on this need for these biological oscillators to be able to maintain an amplitude 
uh, maintain a constant amplitude even though they can, because they are often forced to work with very very in a very large range of frequencies while maintaining the signal to be pretty strong so they look for oscillator circuits that can maintain the amplitude while being able to change the frequency over a very wide range uh, based on I mean, based on the experimental evidence is this a requirement or i mean how how, how much of a constraint is this uh so based on experimental evidence uh from from the central clock studies that we had done, I think I would totally agree uh, with uh, the um, sort of theoretical framework where you have to have an interlinked negative feedback loop and a positive feedback loop to be able to control uh, frequency and the amplitude independently of each other. And as soon as you have a simple negative feedback loop, then the amplitude and uh, the frequency will likely be controlled homeostatically. So I, I would say that it is definitely a requirement that you should have an interlinked feedback loop and a positive feedback, a negative feedback loop and a positive feedback loop to lend itself to independent control of the amplitude and the frequency. Okay. I mean, in fact, that is a circuit they finally uh, zeroed on on in the paper saying that is the one that actually gives them that. So, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So this was the paper that. from Jim Farrell's lab. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Mustafa. Probably uh, when uh, go to the research talk. Okay, let's try. Let's 